I'm very interested in the random. I'm very interested in the accidental. I'm very fatalistic. Um, I like humor. Uh, I like surprises. And history is not something you do in school, in a form, formal course. It's something you do every day. I don't really think of myself as a photographer in the classic sense. Uh, rather, I use the term paraphotographer, uh, which in the same sense that a paramedic or a paralegal person uh, need only know enough about that field to keep someone out of trouble until the real guys show up. That's kind of the way I see it. The first, the first thing I would want to say is that in a group of um, students uh, or even a general audience uh, like this, uh, and I think this advice would probably be uh, useful for you in any kind of a presentation of work or people that you're not familiar with, and that advice is to simply not try to compare this or relate this to what you understand to be uh, photographic work, um, but rather to try and take it on its own terms, try to understand uh, the relationship between the pictures uh, and my explanations of them, so that you see this as a, a more or less um, cohesive body of material not necessarily directly related to what you understand to be your interests or the way that you're pursuing your ideas in this, um, in this medium. So, uh, for the past five or six years, the work that I've been mostly involved in has centered on using sources and images derived in various ways uh, directly from the mass media, rather than from uh, nature uh, or from uh, things that exist in nature, let's put it that way. And I've come to believe, at least for the time being, within the scope of my ideas, that uh, the mass media uh, is nature. At least one can view it as, as that. It's certainly not actual nature and maybe not as organic and interesting as nature might be, but it is really uh, the most important uh, thing that we see. It is the most important vehicle by which we gain information. And therefore, I think of it as, as a, a kind of uh, quasi-nature or semi-nature. The presentation today will be limited to this particular work. During the same period of time, and certainly much earlier, I've focused on a lot of different uh, aspects of subject and, and idea. But today, we'll look at this particular uh, scope or, or uh, particular body of work having to do with the media. And I'll begin by showing you some earlier work from the 60s and 70s, which I feel will lead into and in some ways sort of inform this current uh, material and current interest that I have. Now, as I said, the first few groups of slides will be earlier work. This is from, I think, 1963, and uh, is a, an image which is uh, lifted or, or taken directly from a Los Angeles newspaper. Uh, in its original form, it's about two inches across by maybe an inch high or something, a little tiny uh, ad in the newspaper for a department store. Uh, the thing that I want to discuss with you a moment, for a moment here is the ingredients of this picture, which may not be easily seen from where all of you are sitting, but at the extreme right is a uh, a doll which you wind up and it rocks back and forth and plays Happy Days Are Here Again. This is a, a doll of uh, John Kennedy right, in his rocking chair. The rifle that the young man holds and the sight, of course, aimed at this target but also at uh, John Kennedy's head or the vicinity of his head. The uh, sight and the rifle are exactly the same um, model or style or whatever of the rifle and sight that were used to kill him. At the right, you have, at the left rather, you have the words child guidance toys, which are actually in that position in the newspaper, right? So all around this, you have all these other similar small ads. So I found this tiny segment, isolate that from all of the other contextual material and uh, make the, a series of pictures around this idea. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is made in 1963. Uh, 
And I think when it first appeared, or when I first saw it, was in with about two weeks of when he was assassinated. Um, it was the confluence of uh, finding this thing and, and his assassination which led me to believe that there was something uh, useful uh, for me as a source uh, in the media if, if uh, I could simply find it and find the way to understand its uh, content and meaning. So this, this really is a picture that sort of starts this whole idea of using uh, already produced material for the source of my, uh, my ideas and my work. And these pictures are from uh, 1964 through 1966 or so, and it ultimately was produced in a uh, portfolio of, of lithographs made from these photographs of 25. And uh, these pictures are made by taking uh, magazine pages uh, selected uh, on the basis of what they look like when contact printed to photographic material. So, there's no camera involved here, simply taking the magazine page and putting it in contact with uh, paper, uh, like you would make a photogram, if, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the reason that the, the pictures are in superimposition is that uh, the matrix is, or I should say the, the material, is reading the front and the back of the page at the same time, right, uh, equally. Uh, the reason that they're negative is that the page is positive and uh, we don't see the actual size of the pictures here, but they're all about the size of a magazine page, which is also determined by the fact that they're not enlarged or reduced or anything. And so the magazine page is the actual matrix for the picture, and no alterations are, are made except to select the particular magazine page. The portfolio was actually printed by doing the same process directly onto lithographic plates, so that you go from the magazine page as the matrix to the lithographic plate directly to the printed uh, image. So there's very little intervention or very little mechanical work involved uh, between the seeing or the vision and the actual object, which is a, a premise that I'm very interested in, sort of how to um, uh, eliminate a lot of the kind of technical or, or intermediate kind of zones that are usually associated with photography. Um, the slide on the right, uh, I'll just read you the main headline here, which says, Step by Step, Linda Bird Johnson's Hollywood Beauty Treatment. Um, Linda Bird Johnson, as you may remember or recall, was uh, President Johnson's uh, teenage daughter at the time that he was president, who ran into typical adolescent uh, problems, and of course the, the media jumped on all of this, and for about a month, this all you could see was her picture and her, her problems. And so it was a kind of immediate um, insight into the uh, media's fascination with, uh, uh, you know, public individuals. And in each instance here, or most instances, uh, the text um, either, well, the text can never ex exactly explain the image because the text is associated with only half of what's in superimposition here. So what the text does is simply call up um, an interpretation that has very little to do with the original intent of the material. The text is very important to these these pictures. They're interesting, I think, to me to look at and to see the mixture and, and to sense the kind of quality of superimposition, but it's also the text that, that opens up a kind of interpretation to them. So in the slide on the right, for instance, add man, do it justice, then you have a word that says compare, and up near the uh, face of the individual it says thrilling. portfolio was divided, there are 25 pictures, as I said, divided into five sort of sections, uh, one of which had to do with uh, uh, cosmetics, basically sort of cosmetics and women, another with uh, politics, another of women and children, which is a slide on the right, kind of, uh, another having to do with uh, uh, marriage triangles or cu couples with a third person. <clears throat> and some vague idea about kind of sexual uh, liaisons and uh, in particular kind of lesbian idea. This is now 1968-69. These are magazine collages, that is to say made as collages from magazine pages cut up and, and reassembled and, and uh, uh, pasted down. Um, 
the uh, I think there were ten pictures in the group, and they were all made within a space of maybe about three or four months, I think. And each picture dealt with a specific event that was uh, obviously topical to that time period. The one on the left is called VN Pinup, which stands for Vietnam Pinup. Uh, the the magazine or the newspaper scrap that's in there obviously is an actual uh, incident uh, being described. And the one on the right is called UCB Pinup, which means University of California, Berkeley, where at that time uh, there were intense riots going on in response to the Vietnamese War. Uh, the midsection of this figure is made up of a photograph of two, two students who were maimed in the, uh, in the riots of that time. So all of the pictures that are the kind of news photographs that are incorporated are topical. The others are drawn from uh, uh, fashion ads, uh, you know, in the same uh, context, same magazines or whatever as the other. And technically, there's one thing that's interesting, and I'll try to describe it a little bit, which is that the collage is, is made and, and uh, you know, attached to the board. Uh, then there's a piece of plexiglass put down on top of this, so that there's about a quarter of an inch of space now. On top of that goes a photographic, uh, piece of photographic film, which what you're seeing here is black, is opaque part of the photographic film. Where you're seeing the color, you're looking through the transparent areas of the transparent, or the uh, negative, to what's behind it. So you have about let's say, a quarter of inch of space in there. So when you show slides of it, you can't really see the kind of dimension of it. But there are actually cast shadows from the uh, photographic negative onto the collage material. So it definitely has a kind of slight relief uh, to it. And the other uh, point I would make here, although it's not uh, pertinent to the image particularly, but the, uh, the material from which the images of the black and white film are drawn uh, from negatives of uh, quasi-pornographic uh, uh, film that in Los Angeles or in any major city you can buy. Right? So you have a catalog, you look through there, it'll say, in this instance I think it said something like uh, World War II cheesecake eye contact. That's all you get. Yeah. So you buy that, you send you the roll of film undeveloped, which makes it legal, I think. And uh, it's like Christmas, so you kind of develop this stuff and see what you got. But anyway, these, are, these pictures are used to form these pictures because they are, uh, you know, classic, uh, stylistically uh, correct uh, pinup pictures, the arms up and, and so on. So this also, the reason I'm telling this story is only to relate that to the spirit in which I work, which, as I said, is to try to cut out as much of the kind of intermediate stuff as possible. So I'm not gonna hire a model or uh, get a friend to pose like this when for $12 I can buy a whole roll of these things which are authentic, right? And it's culturally authentic rather than posed or something like that. Okay, the next group of slides are one particular example of um, work which alters existing magazines. I did all kinds of uh, different ways of altering magazines uh, in this case, by printing over each page of the magazine uh, with offset lithography using this photograph, which uh, at that time uh, we probably all still remember or see the photograph of a um, uh, South Vietnamese general with a pistol, the head of, of a guy he's just captain, captured. The uh, companion photograph to that, which wasn't as popular, was this one, which is a, a Vietnamese soldier holding the heads of two children, and he's just decapitated. I, mean, I think it was a little bit too grim for public consumption. But anyway, so I made an uh, offset plate of that image and then overprinted it on each page of a whole series of different magazines in the same position on that page. So as you would uh, go through it, you're simply seeing that image modify whatever it happens to fall on, whether it's a picture or an ad or text or whatever. And not to see a slide of something like this is not the way to see it. It's a magazine, like, you know, imagine yourself in your dentist's office looking at a magazine or something rather than some projected idea. So one might read this, find your man with refill, so it becomes a kind of folk poetry or, or something of that nature. 
or love your hair with refills. I had produced several of these, this particular magazine, and uh, when Time Magazine comes to the newsstand, I think it's like Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock or something like that, I had already put together the magazines. I went to the newsstand and got the current uh, Time magazines, took them back to the studio and put those covers on these magazines, right? and then put them back on the newsstand about 9 o'clock without anybody knowing that now these five or seven magazines are mixed in with these others. Right? Um, so they were sort of, well, not sort of, they were sold as you know, regular Time magazines of that week, only for someone to discover later sort of what they have there. And I think, uh, as I look back at it now, it seems, you know, absolutely irresponsible, but at the time, it seemed just right. You know, but at that time, which was the 60s, uh, I'm a young teacher. Uh, the universities are in turmoil. Uh, riots, uh, and so on, not to mention the war. So anything that one would do at that time, I would have felt probably it was okay to do, whether that was going to affect anything or not. When I say now, it just seems like the climate is much different than it was then. Not all acts that one might do would be acceptable given uh, the current cultural or political climate. This is now 19... 70. Uh, this is a, an environment uh, at the Pasadena Art Museum in Los Angeles, which consists of a separate little room which you have to uh, go in through a, a door. And in this room, uh, you have this situation that you see here. Uh, on the end table with these plastic poinsettias is a magazine which has been altered by imprinting every page with the same image that you see on the television set, which I'll show you a detail of in a moment. Uh, the television then is uh, running on commercial channels, not video or anything, and so whatever is on television is modified through this film positive, which is sitting inside of the television <coughs> set. And I take the front of the set off, put this film positive in there, a uh, high contrast film positive, and put the face of the thing back on. So it's, it's very believable that the thing is inside the set and part of the uh, the image that's being generated. The times that I watched people do this, mostly people about nine years old were interested in this. Other people sort of kind of, you know, look at it, whatever. <laughs> or not. I did this maybe three or four times, but sometimes it would have been a nude figure. Sometimes uh, uh, some other image from uh, public, uh, a public source or a variety of different, uh, different situations. But the which again can't be experienced in slides or anything like that, is that you're sitting in the chair uh, watching uh, whatever happens to be on television becomes the anatomy of this figure or the clothing of this figure or the viscera of this figure or certainly joins into that, that uh, figure. And of course if it's a, a nude female figure as this one is, uh, it's not something that at this point at least in time you would have run into on television. And this, uh, this shows you what your former president looks like with a goatee, that's what this picture is about, kind of, but. Uh, from that same idea that I just showed you, I made a suite of lithographs uh, following the same idea, simply photographing the television set uh, with another film positive inside of it at such point when it seemed to me that the typography or the sort of uh, uh, ironic quality of the text or the product was in some relationship to the uh, figure, which were uh, sort of pornographic pictures. This is now 1978. What we're looking at is two uh, details of two different pictures, uh, which will become clear as I show you more slides, but these are made very close up to the picture, so you're seeing like a very small segment of each one. And as you can see, the one on the left is uh, composed of text and the one on the right composed of uh, small uh, snippets of various snapshots, photographs, things like that. Uh, if you were to move back from the picture somewhat, both pictures, you would see that this image begins to form of this face, right? Uh, one of them made completely from the text uh, material and one from the pictures. So as you enter the gallery, you see these two identical pictures 
And then, of course, as you move forward, as we just sort of went through with the slides, you begin to see that they are different pictures. This is a portrait of Susan Sontag, uh, made very closely after the publication of her book on photography, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. This is a book which is probably the first American uh, author uh, or intellectual, I would say, to really try to understand what photography is and how it relates to the society, how it relates to the culture, what its meanings are, other than uh, previous to that, people more interested in what the application of this medium was, art, uh, journalism, illustration, what have you. So it's a very important book, and I was very taken by it, but at the same time, uh, rather critical of some aspects of it. So at any point, I used that to uh, as a kind of source for these two pictures. And then if one went back and looked more closely, this is her book, right? I mean, this is uh, most of the main ideas of the book are incorporated into the closet. You can't read it consistently, but you can pick out a paragraph or a phrase or whatever and, and really get a very interesting reading of, of the, whole, uh, the whole book. Yeah, this is my signature, uh, which I think is probably the best part of the whole thing. But the, the whole thing is stapled together, right? And at this point, the staples, or at least the one that was sold, the staples are all rusted. This was made with very early Polaroid material, so half the pictures are now brown, and uh, the whole thing is disappearing, is what I'm getting at, which is another thing that I sort of enjoy. This is 1981, and this would be about the time period where most of these things began to focus a, a little bit more clearly for me. Um, these pictures are also photograms uh, made by uh, taking cibachrome photographic paper, which is a color positive acting paper, and in complete darkness, holding the paper up against the uh, face of the television set, the screen, right? And then turning the television set off and on very briefly, maybe a second or two. Uh, what happens then is that the image that's on television creates the latent image in the paper, right? So again, there's no camera, there's no intervention, whatever. Uh, the reason that they're fuzzy like they are is that there's about a quarter of an inch of glass between the paper and where the image is. So uh, it can't focus uh, like cleanly like it, it would if, if it was in direct contact. But I prefer that kind of uh, softer and uh, more indistinguishable image for this work. When, uh, when I was making the, the initial photograms, you're in complete darkness and there's no sound, right? Except when you turn the television on, then you will hear about four syllables. A springtime of hope in that second and a half or something like that. So my memory of the entire important address was simply these snippets. Races, creeds, and nationalities. Of, of syllables. And somehow I made the connection between my experience of that. And for your friendship and trust. And how to add that text to the uh, to the pictures. To shield our liberties. On the uh, left is Donnie and Marie Osmond together, right? Which I've always suspected some kind of incestuous idea there anyway, but and Reagan on the right and on his side. Uh, under the Donnie and Marie Osmond it says share in the bounty and under Reagan it says the other way around. Now these are all actual extra, that's nice, yeah, other way around. Uh, Actual excer excerpts from his uh, talk. This is Jimmy Stewart. It says, is quiet but deep, which he was, kind of, or is, I guess. On the right, Ronald Reagan says, thrift and crushes. This is Frank Sinatra. It says, use our friendship. So Reagan says, out of factory gates. This is Nancy and Ronald dancing. I forget the text here. I don't have it written down. And this is Nancy and Ronald and Justice Berger at the actual inauguration. And the text there says, less than a miracle. Put. So the whole thing is maybe about 15 or 20 foot wide, something like that. A robed church choir saying, God bless America. Now, this next group of pictures uh, take off in a little bit different direction. but uh, And there's a whole group of these, I think 40 some. Let me read it real quickly here. Uh, posing subjects in garments designed to represent African animal skins achieves the sense of a wild and untamed predator. 
At the same time, the choice of these garments can connote a committed social and or political conscience. First, it proclaims a sympathy for the recent social taboo against wearing actual animal pelts. Secondly, it demonstrates understanding and support for the customs and interests of emerging third world nations. However, terms such as jungle beast, a Tarzan tan, and safari chic should not come to mind. The leopard spot pattern predominates as is revealed in the top row and can be effectively adapted to garments ranging from lingerie, sportswear, business clothes, to sophisticated evening wear. So these are all photographs using the SX-70, uh, copying things out of mail order catalogs. Uh, but as maybe you can grasp the text, the text is written in such a way as to uh, identify these pictures as uh, serious, you know, kind of social documents or politically uh, relevant uh, documents. And the SX-70, more than any other photographic uh, instrument, at least in my view and at this time, does mean that this photograph is made directly from nature because we don't associate it with something that you could, you could copy something this big or whatever. So there is a kind of uh, indication of reality here as opposed to the fact, which is that these are all people uh, in mail order catalogs. Uh, the text is similarly trying to ride a kind of edge between describing what's actually going on in the pictures, but bringing, uh, bringing into that a kind of ironic or sort of undercutting it itself. And then, uh, this is now 1984. These are made actually on the, the 20 by 24, or so-called 20 by 24 inch Polaroid camera. Right? So these are all things that are made uh, uh, very uh, spontaneously from television or video in this case, and, and not, uh, uh, not able to actually plan the registration in ways that one could do with a conventional uh, photography. So these are direct Polaroid uh, prints. And so the piece is about the size as you see it projected here, each one of these being 20 by 24. So this can either mean uh, that this is sort of the ideal visage of this uh, particular kind of news person, or an ideal hairstyle for a news person, or something like that. Right? The three photographs of the Caucasian woman are uh, Diane Sawyer and Jane Pauley and Joan London, who are the morning, or were the morning uh, newswomen on the uh, sort of wake-up shows. Huh? These are also made originally by placing the paper on the television set, which is why they have that uh, fuzzy kind of look. Then this, the television uh, sets, or the, the faces of the television sets are stripped onto these pictures. The text is uh, uh, also stripped in, and then the lithograph is made. Text here, starting in the top left, says, Waking up in News America with mostly blue-eyed blondes, pretending another occidental sunrise, barely sensing the technologic bonsai. Uh, the fourth picture at the bottom right is um, uh, obviously an Asian woman. I think it's Connie Chung, I'm not real sure, but uh, bonsai is a word which doesn't translate very easily from Japanese to English, but uh, in World War II, bonsai was what the Japanese soldiers would, would yell when they were doing their kamikaze runs and things. It means basically kill the bastard, something like that. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, at any rate, this lithograph, which was first produced just as, a, as you see it here, uh, later I adapted to uh, a couple of different installations, one at the Seattle Art Museum and one at the uh, Art Institute in Chicago, most recently. And this would be uh, a view into this room from an adjacent gallery. Basically, the idea is very claustrophobic. Everything in the room, floor, ceiling, walls, all of the objects are collaged and covered with uh, scraps of the same lithograph. Right? Uh, you can actually discern you know, the figure from the wall or whatever, which is a little bit difficult in the slides. But it is very uh, obsessive. And uh, these same words that I just read to you are coming out of all of these images. And these pictures are just like a kind of uh, eruption of uh, 
of imagery when you're inside the room. And it's rather a little bit lower light than you see in the side. So it's kind of dim and kind of uh, dingy looking in there. Looking down at a little uh, end table which has coffee cup and cigarettes and ashtray and TV guide, all the things you need for watching in the morning. A detail of a television set, which is again all covered with this stuff, um, which is on, but between channels, uh, so that what you're getting is a kind of uh, slow, or not slow, but very um, almost inaudible white noise, kind of irritating, static kind of noise, as if the channel had gone off or something and one had been there all night. Kind of yeah. One has to be in it to understand or to feel it, kind of. And this is uh, some slides from a book which I made in 1984 through 1986. Actually, I brought a couple with, with me. If we want to look at them later, we can. Um, this is the cover on the left and the back cover on the right slide. title of the book is called 1984, A Case Study in Finding an Appropriate TV Newswoman, parentheses, a CBS docudrama in words and pictures, Robert Heineken. The entire book is laid out uh, as the slide on the right indicates. There's four vertical columns, text below each column, which um, explain the whole idea of what's going on, which I will briefly mention to you, uh, although it's sort of a complicated idea, but um, it's written as if the person who's making the book and making the photographs has been hired by CBS to determine how to go about hiring a new newswoman to replace Diane Sawyer, who's just been promoted to 60 Minutes, which is what actually went on in, during this period of time. Um, so the writer of the book convinces CBS that the only intelligent way to do this is to put the new candidates in superimposition with the existing members of the staff to see who looks best, right? which, which coincides sort of with uh, what newscasters are supposed to be looking good, that kind of idea. So it's very complicated in terms of all these explanations of that. But yeah, this is a combination of Diane Sawyer and Tom Brokaw, who, who uh, the writer has determined would make an ideal couple. Right? And he talks about he, I mean me, but uh, how beautifully androgynous this is, and, and uh, uh, it's all American, and so on, and that this is what they're trying to find. Right? Although these people are working for different net networks, so they can't be hired that way. This is a combination of Connie Chung and Steve Baskerville, who is the weatherman on this program, who is one of the fixtures. He's going to stay no matter what. And uh, it discusses uh, maybe the problem with this is a little bit, uh, I forget the language, too male. Or there's something wrong with this combination, so we move on. This is uh, Maria Shriver and uh, Steve Baskerville. Always, if, if, uh, if I were to read it to you, the, the, each picture is discussed very carefully in terms of whether this is the right person to hire. Right? Is this... So is this combination right or not? I forgot to tell you the premise, which was that when the camera, this is all false, of course, when the camera cuts from one person to the next, there will be a subliminal, subliminal, what am I saying? Subliminal uh, image that people will see of those two people superimposed, and that's what they'll remember. That's the premise for making all these uh, superimpositions in the thing. Sort of phrenology idea. The final page of the book, which uh, is the most, I mean, the rest of it is sort of interestingly written and on some edge between fiction and, and fact and whatever, but this is serious and does uh, pretend at least to explain the whole premise of the book and, and goes much beyond the sort of silliness or whatever of the book into what I consider to be actual, uh, actual problem like. This has a similar uh, idea, which is that uh, there are photographs of Barbara Walters, who's the uh, 
venerated newswoman, as you know, on the right, and a young woman named Faith Daniels, who looks uh, fairly similar to a young Barbara Walters and has the same kind of almost uh, lisp kind of quality. One is almost convinced that, that they're, you know, they bred this woman for a replacement or something. Uh, so it's just simple matter, or not simple, but a matter of finding them with identical expressions by taping a lot and looking at the tapes and then re-photographing them from the screen. These are all about, what, 15 by 20 inch units here. So this whole, uh, whole picture, depending on how it's configured, gets to be about as big as our projection screen here, something like that. And these are uh, two pictures here, about the same size as I described before, uh, with uh, various excerpts from, from uh, advertisements, primarily, although not always which seem kind of surreal to me. And, and whenever I have, uh, at this time at least, uh, some free time, I would search the tapes, try and find some things, photograph them, and then put them back together in these different configurations. So they don't always, we wouldn't find this configuration together necessarily. It might be a different one or new pictures or something like that. There's a different version of some of those things. This work uh, is also late 1987, so still pretty I mean, current, actually. And what we have here are magazine pages, which are formed over three-dimensional objects, such as, uh, well, whatever, uh, so that they have a relief, right? Maybe two or three inches in relief. They're, they're dampened and then put over these objects, so when they dry, they hold that shape, right? Then they're varnished from the back, so that they are actually stiff you know, relief sculptures, kind of. And each one of those is put into a relationship with all of uh, various uh, other kinds of magazine pages to create these figures, right? So these are, are three-dimensional relief objects, right? This one on the left is called First Class Mail. And he's got all this stuff, right? Cigarettes, beer, dirty pictures, so on. Hairy chest. He's got a rose in his teeth. Got everything. This one is called Health Conscious Young Woman. Background is a flat black lacquer, so it becomes, sort of disappears. And so all of the objects that are used are life-size objects in the magazine. Right? So the pictures actually are, are made of life-size things, more or less. This is called Give Her Diamonds. These, these phrases uh, sometimes occur somewhere in the picture, like at the top of this or across her head, it says something about give her diamonds. This is called October transvestite. Okay, these are the last slides coming up. This is a the slide on the left is the entire piece. It's called uh, Upper Middle Class Nuclear Family, and this is about 11 feet across seven feet high at its highest point and, and has a, a teenage daughter on the left, the father, then a son, then the mother, and then a baby on the far right. And these things just sit on the floor up against the wall. And again, everything's life size. So if, if you were six feet high, tall, you'd be looking right into this, the, the man's head like that. What's involved in here, I, I guess is implied really, is looking through a lot of magazines. Right? and then sorting those all out, and then trying to find the pages again, and then uh, assembling them. That's the entire piece again. This is another similar idea, using simply the covers of the magazines, distorted, or formed in distorted ways over different kinds of masks or, or objects or whatever. I started talking to you earlier about the uh, magazine page photographs, black and white and reverse or whatever. So uh, last year I began to work with these magazine pages, which are uh, printed onto Cibachrome, which is, as I said before, positive acting color paper. So rather than reversing the image, uh, it prints it, it correctly. And rather than having a negative uh, 
negative color, you're actually getting the mixture of color directly from the inks that are involved in the magazine page itself. So it's the same process, but completely different idea about how, or, or idea about the result. So again, these are made by placing the magazine page on Cibachrome paper, exposing it to light, uh, <coughs> developing it. But these are just one single sheet of paper with one image on, on one side and one on the other. And it doesn't matter which, which side is down. I mean, the paper is thin enough that both you know, print exactly the same. If you turn the page over, you would simply transpose the whole thing left to right, which may be, depending on, you know, in some cases, which text you want to read, where there is text. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in the profession of teaching, and I try to do it, I try to continually uh, bring my uh, full attention to how to do that and why to do it and how to alter why and how to do it as things shift uh, around educational ideas. And this is the, m the most hypothetic part of what I'm talking to you about, but maybe also the most true. Uh, I say that there are uh, ideas about abstraction, there are ideas about symbols, uh, there are ideas about uh, uh, reality, there are ideas about form, and there are ideas about expression, and that that's all there is. Those are the five modes that are available to any individual as an artist in any field. Now, obviously, that's putting a box around a very large idea, but for purposes of clarity and, and to communicate my ideas to you more clearly, I'm saying those are the only things that you can do. He starts out with the photography classes, but that starts to emerge and evolve into a larger concept of just teaching about, maybe just about life, I don't know, but certainly about the larger aspect of the visual arts. Heineken is probably still influencing photo students who don't even know it. People constantly remark that, that a lot of his work looks like it was made yesterday, or at least strategies that he used were made, you know, that something that's very current. And that's actually, I think that kind of guerrilla mentality that he had is, is, is effective. You know. He had this idea, I think, about breaking rules, that there was nothing that was so structured that you couldn't then, you know, rip it apart. I think that his legacy was that, that he just showed you, he just kind of showed you that you could do anything and that you didn't have to have any set parameters or be inside a little box. So he was using the photograph, not the camera, as a way to discuss what was going on using that medium. He, that was very radical at the time. But he wanted to alter each person individually, they were thinking about where they were, how they, what, what their space was. He wanted to make them rethink. It's like somebody poking you and saying, look again, look again. He knew he was getting Alzheimer's or dementia. He knew what was happening to him, but he, he, was, he still produced work, and that's all he wanted to do. Bob compulsively entertained his curiosity Robert compulsively loved his dog, Gypsy. Raoul compulsively told long, 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 long jokes. Heineken compulsively exercised his mind. Raoul compulsively played pool, cards, and jokes. Heineken, Bob, Raoul compulsively smoked cigarettes and drank gin straight. Bob compulsively laid carpet and tile. Raoul compulsively adored women and Robert made his friends laugh and cry. Okay, that's it, thank you. <laughs>